bienvenidos a todos. Gracias. Me llamo Daphne Lei, uh, la directora de Illuminaciones. Uh, Illuminations is Chancellor's Arts and Culture Initiative. Our goal is to bring arts and culture to every part of the campus, and in this case, the community as well. Uh, no matter what kind of majors or disciplines um, you are. Uh, so today, it is my greatest pleasure to have our very, very special guests here and to host this event, uh, Latinx Theater uh, Past, Present, and Future. And it's my distinguished, it's, it's uh, my, it's in, um, my greatest pleasure to have our guests, uh, the founding fathers of Chicano Theater, mm -hmm. and the founding fathers <laughs> Latinx scholarship. Right. And so, uh, so today's event, uh, so Luis uh, Valdez and uh, Jorge Huerta, of course, no, uh, no need for introduction. Mm -hmm. And today's event uh, will be moderated by, uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, Tiffany Lopez, uh, that's the Dean of uh, Trevor School of the Arts. And the speakers will be introduced by uh, Ricardo Rocha, uh, who's a recent alum. Um, so uh, before I start, I just want to uh, give my greatest thanks to uh, uh, Dean Lopez and all the support uh, from the school, uh, Caritura School of the Arts, all the staff support, and certainly uh, the thanks to the to the uh, managing director of Illuminations, uh, Debbie Nielsen. Uh, so first of all, I would like to welcome um, Dr. Uh, professor uh, Rodrigo uh, Lasso, uh, who's the uh, professor of <laughs> Professor of English and also the interim uh, vice chancellor of uh, diversity, uh, equity, diversity and inclusion. He's going to say a few words uh, to, of welcome. Bueno, buenas tardes, bienvenidos, un placer estar aquí. Uh, it, uh, it really is an uh, amazing event to be here uh, for, to see this uh, because we're, we're today in conversation with figures who are really uh, important to uh, Latino studies, Latinx studies, and uh, in the field. So it, it prompts me to think a little bit about something that happened at UCI a few years ago is that we became uh, what is known as a Hispanic serving university. Um, which is actually a federal designation that says something about our students. We're um, more than 26% uh, of our students are now of uh, Latinx background. But often for me, that question that comes up is not just to be Hispanic serving, but what does it mean to be Latinx thriving? What does it mean to be really uh, 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 running a university that puts uh, Latinx uh, students, Latinx cultures at the center? And I think that this event is um, an example of what it means to be Latinx thriving. It really, and, it, and the reason for that is because it puts culture in its many forms at the center of our uh, thought today. And so um, uh, thanks uh, to all of you for being here and thank you for inviting me to be part of this because I, I just wanna be able to think through uh, with these uh, amazing presenters today. So uh, bienvenidos. Gracias. So now I want to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Ricardo Rocha, who's a recent uh, alum. Uh, he just graduated a few years ago from the UCI uh, PhD, um, drama PhD program. So he's going to introduce the speakers today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lei. Thank you. Dean Lopez for organizing this really, really important, monumental, I think historic event. I had a bad dream a couple nights ago, <laughs> more like a nightmare. I dreamt that Ron DeSantis was trying to sabotage this event. I really, <laughs> seriously, I was like, what, what, what do I say to introduce this? And, and I really had this, this intense dream and they were collaborating with an EBE an extraterrestrial biological entity, right? <laughs> so it was really out there. But it made me you know, really reflect on how grateful I think we are um, as Californians, as Southern Californians, as Americans, for the work of over 50 years 
that Luis and Jorge have gifted us with. Thank you for that work of over 50 years. Thank you for preparing us intellectually, artistically, personally, politically against the forces of inequity. It would have been a very different world. En serio, hubiera sido un mundo muy diferente. Very different world without that work. Thank you, Dr. Huerta, for your mentorship. It has been a powerful blessing in my life. I know, I told him everything he said. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You did. You did. Because I had the honor of serving on Dr. Rocha's dissertation committee. Yes, yeah, and there are other people here también, so you're all, I, I won't tell you about all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Gracias, profe. So allow me to introduce our speakers, uh, our honored speakers, and our wonderful moderator. So Luis Valdez is regarded as one of the most important influential playwrights living today. He's internationally renowned. He is internationally renowned and at Nobel Award-winning theater company, El Teatro en Campesino, the Farm Workers Theater, was founded by Luis in 1965. In the heat of the United Farm Workers struggle and the Great Delano Grape Strike in California Central Valley. His countless awards include LA Drama Critics Awards, Drama Log Awards, Bay Area Critics Awards, and the George Peabody Award for Excellence in Television, the Presidential Medal of the Arts, the Governor's Award for the California Arts Council, and Mexico's prestigious Aguila Azteca Award given to individuals whose work promotes cultural excellence and exchange between the U.S. and Mexico. His Zoot Suit is the first Chicano play on Broadway and the first major Chicano film. As screenwriter, he is best known for his hit film, La Bamba, <laughs> which I enjoyed over and over again as a child. <laughs> In 2016, he was awarded the National Medal of the Arts by President Obama at the White House. As an educator, he has taught at the University of California, Berkeley, UC Santa Cruz, Fresno State University, and is one of the co-founding professors of CSU Monterey Bay. His latest book, Theater of the Sphere, was published in 2022. Thank you so much. Dr. Jorge Huerta is a Chancellor's Associate Professor of Theater Emeritus at the University of California, San Diego. He is a leading authority on contemporary Latinx theater, a prolific writer, director, and dedicated educator. His two monographs are Chicano Theater, Themes and Forms, and Chicano Drama, Society, Performance, and Myth. He also co-authors the Rutledge Performance Practitioner Series on Luis Valdez. Dr. Huerta was inducted into the College of Fellows of the American Theater in 1994 and elected National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies Scholar in 1997. He was awarded the Association for Theater in Higher Education Lifetime Achievement in Educational Theater Award in 2007 and recognized as the Distinguished Scholar by the American Society for Theater Research in 2008. He received the Latino Spirit Award by the California State Assembly and recognized for outstanding contributions for education in 2009. Welcome, Dr. Huerta. <laughs> Dr. Tiffany Ana Lopez is the Dean of the Clara Turbis School of the Arts. She is a scholar, writer, dramaturg, and advocate for Latinx theater. She is a founding member of the Latino Theater Alliance of Los Angeles and has worked as a dramaturg with important theaters such as the Mark Taper Forum, Cornerstone Theater Company, and Oregon Shakespeare Festival. She has received many prestigious awards, including a Hispanic lifestyle Latina of influence and a Fulbright Scholar, and has been awarded numerous grants and fellowships from the Mellon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Rockefeller Foundation. So please, once again, let's welcome Luis Valdez. And Dr. Tiffany Lopez. Oh my God. 
my gosh. Thank you so much. Thank you to Illuminations, uh, to the community of people here in this room that you inspire this work and uh, and just and to uh, the office of the inclusive excellence, uh, the provost's office, and because it takes a village to really do this work, and it speaks to the commitment of UCI to have this work be at the heart of what the university is about. So I want to just acknowledge that and thank people. Uh, we're about to go on an incredible journey. Uh, we're going to go for about an hour long journey with these two tremendous figures in Latinx theater uh, and uh, theater history. And we want to leave uh, a tight 15 minutes for burning questions. <laughs> and my guess is the burning questions you start to have they will anticipate and talk about that. But I, as a ma as a facilitator, uh, it's just an honor to be trusted by the both of them to help us really keep the the journey of the conversation moving uh, forward. I want to uh, share with you uh, about their influence. Uh, there's there's an image. We were part of the the National Latinx Theater Commons, and Juliet Carrillo who is a director in our drama faculty. And I, I wanna have like a pride point here in that the UCI drama faculty has four Latinx professors. Mm -hmm. Juliet Carrillo, Lonnie Alcaraz, Efren Delgadillo Jr., and myself as director, scenic design, lighting design, and dramaturgy. That's a pretty extraordinary mm -hmm. range. Mm -hmm. So Juliet was directing this exercise uh, where we made a living sculptor, sculpture, and we had uh, Luis and Jorge in the middle, and we had five minutes for people to put their hands on a shoulder of someone who had influenced their career, and uh, also, it, that was it, put a hand on somebody that influenced your career, beginning with the two of them. And, at the, and there were 50 of us in the room, and at the end of that exercise, everyone was linked to both Jorge and Luis, and we, all of us, had people touching us that we'd influence them. Mm -hmm. So in, in, when we were talking before coming to this uh, conversation, I would not be here doing this work if it wasn't for the two of them. Luis told a story about um, Jose Montoya and the work that they were doing and from the Central Valley to Northern California and how they were taking the art on the road. And I, when I went to Cal State Sacramento to do my bachelor's degree, studied uh, with Olivia Castellano, who's friends with Jose Montoya, and we just started talking about just that impact and then the journey going forward to now. So it's it's a very incredible thing and so many of you here in this room you're you're part of that living sculpture so i i wanted to share about that we develop lifelong uh, connections and impact and that exercise made that clear um jorge huerta as the really the father of the field of uh, latinx theater studies uh, chicano theater studies he coined a term called necessary theater like that the work that we do, it's absolutely necessary. And uh, as a, he's a movement-based scholar, and then uh, uh, Luis Valdez is a movement-based artist and took that concept of necessary theater into the fields, saying that if Chicanos weren't going to the theater, you had to bring the, the teatro to the fields, and that teatro fuels community and community fuels Teatro. So the two of them have had a lifelong journey together as artists about the impact of the work. Um, you'll hear Luis talk and Jorge talking about their book, Theater of the Sphere, and the important concept of the zero. And that really begins with doing work that you're connected to the heart. Luis will share more. Uh, but that concept of the zero being the world that, that we're all interconnected with. So um, I want to uh, open by inviting uh, Luis and uh, Jorge to talk about the work of Necessary Theater and the concept of En La Quesh. And I know Luis has a poem he wants to read from to really have us started on 
the terms of the conversation about in La Quiche and Jorge talking about necessary theater. So I'm going to open to, to Luis. All right. Thank you, Tiffany. Dr. Lopez. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I want to begin with an excerpt from uh, an epic poem that I wrote back in 1972. It's published in early works, uh, Arte Publico Press. You can get this uh, on Amazon. It's just Actos and Bernabe, one of my plays, and Pensamiento Serpentino. That's the excerpt I'm going to read. It's uh, Pensamiento Serpentino, a Chicano approach to the theater of reality. And then it's got a, it says, Cada cabeza es un mundo. That's kind of like the theme. And here's the, the excerpt. Teatro. Eres el mundo. Y las paredes de los buildings más grandes son... Nothing but scenery. The dialogue, esta gran pantomima de la tierra, is written in English, in German, in Frances, in Spanish, in Italiano, in Tagalog. It is a giant improvisation con role playing by men and women y las razas del mundo playing master and slave, rich and poor, black and white. But underneath it all is the truth, the spiritual truth that determines all materia, la energía that creates the universe, la fuerza con purpose, la primera cause de todo, even before the huelga, the first cause, the creation, Dios, el director de la great farce, o gran tragedia, depending on your predilection. Los indios knew of this long ago, hace muchos años que cantaban en su flor y canto de las verdades científicas y religiosas del mundo. Sin embargo, however, we were conquistados and colonizados, and we, we, la raza de bronce, began to think we were europeos, and that their vision, their vision of reality was it. But reality is una gran serpiente, a great serpent that moves and changes and keeps crawling out of its dead skin, despojando su pellejo viejo to emerge clean and fresh. La nueva realidad nace de la realidad vieja. And so, los oprimidos del mundo continue to become los libertadores in the true progress of cosas. And the Chicano is part of the process. El proceso cósmico that will liberate our conquistadores or their descendants Así es que el gauchupín y el gabacho will be Mexicanized. But first, el chicano must Mexicanize himself para no caer en cultural trampas. And that means that not Thomas Jefferson nor Karl Marx will liberate the chicano. Not Mahatma Gandhi or Mao Zedong, if he's not liberated first by his propio pueblo, by his Popol Vuh, his Chilambalam, his Chichen Itza, Kukulkan, Gukumat, Quetzalcoatl. Y qué lindo es estudiar de su pueblo de uno. We must all become neo-mayas, porque los mayas really had it together. Dios, Hunabku, el único dador de la medida y el movimiento, was a mathematically moral concept of the supreme being, el señor de los astros. Religion and science were una sola cosa para los mayas de la antigüedad. Just look at their moral concept in that edge. Tu eres mi otro yo, which they derived from studying the sunspots. Their communal life was not based on intellectual agreement. It was based on a vision de los cosmos, porque el hombre pertenece a las estrellas. Así es que the Christian concept of love thy neighbor as thyself was ingrained into their daily behavior. They wouldn't think of acting any other way. Because you that read this are me. And I, who write this, am you. And I wish you well, wherever you are. Que Dios camine contigo. In la quech. Si te amo y te respeto a ti, me amo y me respeto yo. Si te hago daño a ti, me hago daño a mí. In la quech. You are my other me. If I love and respect you, I love and respect myself. If I do harm to you, I do harm to myself. And that's the excerpt. Now, thank you. It is uh, an excerpt 
from the poem, but that's essentially the essence. This was written in 1972 in an epic kind of stream of consciousness. I had one of uh, my director of the Tetra Campesino was picking up my papers as I was writing it because it was just a flow that started. But I felt in 1972, seven years into the history of El Teatro Campesino, that we needed to define our terms. We had been so busy just doing, we hadn't defined why or how we were doing it. So this was the beginning. The following year, 1973, Peter Brook and his International Center for Theater Research out of Paris came to San Juan Bautista, our, our base in San Juan, and of the three months they spent in the United States uh, that summer, two of them were in San Juan Bautista with us exchanging contact. And his, his, he was a famous world, still is, a world famous director. He wrote The Empty Space. And I found that we connected just emotionally and personally in a great way. Uh, he brought an international group of actors, including a 26-year-old blonde named Helen Mirren, who was in San Juan for, for two months. She went away with a tattoo that was the Naui Olin, the four movement. And she was on Oprah not so long ago on the Oprah show. You know, she showed the tattoo. She still has it. She puts makeup on it. She played the Queen of England with the Naui Olin symbol <laughs> on her hand, you know. So the following year, 74, I came here to the campus of UC Irvine for a two-week residency. We had just been in the Old Globe in, in San Diego, and we took two weeks. And I conducted a two-week workshop of what was then the beginnings of the theater of the sphere, the vibrant being workshop. At, it so happens that exactly at that moment, here in Irvine, the great Polish director, Jerzy Grotowski, was in-house. And so we met, we had to meet, and when we met, he said, Peter Berg told me about you. He said we should meet. <laughs> because Peter, uh, but Jerzy Grotowski was the author and the creator of a thing called Theater of the Poor the poor theater, because in Poland after World War II, they had nothing, they had no lights, they had no costumes, so they used the body. And as it turns out, that was the connection because we were using, we were poor also, so we were using our bodies and we found that we really resonated. He was a lot more serious. We used humor, but he used tragedy, but it was an enormous meeting. We took him to a Mexican restaurant in Santana, you know? <laughs> And uh, he passed away too young, unfortunately, but that becomes as one of my treasured memories of, of the, my life in the theater. But it so happens that it was right here, two weeks at UC Irvine. I haven't been back since then. It is my pleasure to be back. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, Pensamiento Serpentino. It was wonderful to hear you read it and to share with us about the homecoming. This uh, conversation evolved. We first did this conversation at Stanford uh, several years before the pandemic. And uh, it was so powerful for the audience, but also for Luis and Jorge. Uh, that they've been taking it on the road. And so this is a wonderful <laughs> way to come back because the theater is even more necessary now. These conversations are even more necessary now. So I wanna uh, have Jorge share with you, you've heard about the foundational concept of En La Cache, the importance of Mayan philosophy and how it circles. Uh, and I uh, would like Jorge to share about the concept of necessary theater. Luis Valdez is a tough act to follow. <laughs> but I wouldn't be in this room if it weren't for Luis Valdez. I was a Mexican-American high school drama teacher in Riverside, California in 1968. And I had the opportunity to go see the Teatro Campesino. I didn't know who they were at UC Riverside. And I heard this man reading uh, Corky Gonzalez's epic poem, I Am Joaquin. And uh, just to listen, you could, I could listen to this man all day long. I, I say he has a radio voice, and he does, and he uses it very well. <laughs> but I can't say I had anything to do with that. God, they gave him that voice, but he also gave him the creativity. So I'm sitting there watching these farm workers and listening to his voice and seeing the slides. The film, they made the film of I Am Joaquin, and it became a staple of every Chicana, Chicano, gathering, demonstration on all the campuses because it spoke to our history, to who we were. It was called critical race theory. 
<laughs> I'm referring, where are you, Ricardo? Yeah, you, you brought, I was going to say it anyway. But nonetheless, uh, having seen that, I said, you know, honey, uh, to my wife, Ginger, I said, I, I need to get into a PhD program. I need to find out more about my, my history. I was born in Boyle Heights, son of a mariachi musician. How more Mexican can you be? <laughs> And I didn't want to be Mexican in the 50s. I looked Mexican, but I didn't sound Mexican. And, and students would say, well, what are you? Like, what are you? I knew what they meant, but they couldn't use the M word because in, when we were growing up, M was always followed by, preceded by dirty Mexican, lazy Mexican, lousy, sleepy. So I needed to find out more. My dad tried to give me pride in being Mexicano, but it was hard for all of us at that time growing up in that period when it was full of, of a lot of it, which continues to this day, called racism. I use the word cultural insensitivity because nobody wants to believe that he or she is a racist, but we all are in some way or another, you know, critical, critical of people who are not like us. So I went to UC San Diego, into the UC Santa Barbara in 1970 to enter the PhD program. I was only 12 and... Uh, <laughs> I always get a laugh on that, and I don't know why. <laughs> and so there I am with Ginger, my wife, and our two baby sons, and I enter the Chicano movement, a uh, huevo, as they say in the barrio. <laughs> and, and it was a, a real life-changing experience. And the teatro came to, San, to Santa Barbara, and I went up to Valdez. I hadn't met him, and I said, my name is Jorge Huerta. I'm directing Teatro Mecha here on campus, and I'm a PhD student in theater, and he, he said, I can't, I can't imitate his voice. He said, good. <laughs> that's a bad imitation. He said, good, we need scholars. And that's what motivated me. And why did I need somebody to tell me that? Because I was always told we did not need scholars. You people work in the fields. I had an English teacher who said, you don't want to go to college. You people should you know, join the army, uh, work with your hands, take shop, shop, shop. And fortunately, we both had parents who appreciated the value of education. So there I am, and he gave me a, a go-ahead, you know, study the Aztecs, study the Maya. So I did. And from there on, it was just, you know, uh, an incredible ride being the person who was going to create the academic discipline of Chicano theater. There was no such thing. A lot of people introduced me as the first Chicano to get a PhD in Chicano theater. No, it's world theater. If all I knew to teach was Chicano theater, that's a limitation. We are of the world, you know? We need to learn from our African roots, our Asian, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we began this wonderful relationship where he was the director doing this world-class theater, and, and we were learning from him. We would have workshops up in San Juan. Ginger, my wonderful wife, was our Armenian business manager, the teatro. <laughs> and I tell the teatros, you should all have an Armenian business manager. <laughs> They'd be in better shape today. And, uh, and the musical director, an Armenian musical director. Anyway, so, so it's been a joy. It's been an honor. I have to tell you that I wrote an introduction to this. <laughs> and you'll all read it. Uh, and it's about Luis's works, what he has done in terms of the plays that he has written. Everybody knows the movies. Everybody can see the movies. You can read so many of the things that he has published. But uh, he created a movement of teatristas all over the country. And, and I created a movement of scholars. And we have several. Ricardo is a part of that. Professor Jade Powers Sotomayor, another of our PhD students from the San Diego campus. And on and on. It's a thrill to be here to share with you what he's done, what he inspired me to do, and the young people that are still inspiring me as a scholar. All right. <laughs> and, and you? Thank you. <laughs> and, and you've talked about the, the critical work of the scholar and, and uh, is that, you know, if we're not out there documenting, writing about it, inserting it in history, what, through the scholarship, but also through the artistry, no one knows it existed, right? It has to be resurrected. Um, it has to be documented so that we can really be part of history, but part of passing things forward. Because we have so many students in this room, I'd love for you each to share a little bit about uh, crossroads moments that you faced in college that really set the 
trajectory for the work you would do as movement-based artist and movement-based scholar. Um, you, sh you shared a little bit about that in your story um, in meeting uh, Luis. Uh, I know you started your college life as a, a math and physics major. Yes, I so I would love for you to share a little bit about, you know, what were those crossroads moments? Well, I was born into a migrant farm working family. And so it uh, didn't take long for me to realize I had to do something other than pick in the fields, you know, to support myself. So I had a, a, a love of mathematics uh, from grammar school and on. So uh, I followed really in the footsteps of my older brother who became an engineer. He was the first one to graduate from college, my brother Frank, who's, uh, who's gone now. He, he passed away, unfortunately. But the, the thing is that uh, he and I used to have talks about going out into outer space, you know, becoming astronauts. This is uh, in, in the early 50s, in 51, 52. We're dreaming uh, of these things. So when he went in, in, into the sciences, I followed in his footsteps because we shared the love of, of math and physics. And I loved the scientific approach. I felt that uh, it was something I could relate to. The whole scientific method, the empirical method, all of those were things that I, I found great comfort in. They, they were predictable. I like, I like math because you could work on a problem and if you knew, if you were doing it right, you'd have an answer, right? Unlike my life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but the thing is, it, 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 there were still problems. My, my brother graduated before me and he went into the aerospace industry and he came back with reports that there was a great deal of racism where, at Vandenberg Air, uh, Air Force Base where he was working as an engineer against Mexicans and blacks and anybody. And he was an engineer already but even the lower, the technicians, you know, who didn't have his degree uh, were racist, you know. And so I began to rethink then my future. I said, well, really, the problem is I've got to attack this head on. And so I decided to switch majors, go to English, because I got tired of people asking me if I could speak English, you know. Como que no cabrón, seguro que sí. You know, there's a... But I, used to, I love the English language. You know, I have no problem. I love European culture. You know, I don't know what the deal is, why people are so afraid. Uh, we're Anglos, you know. I say, I'm a brown Anglo, you know. I was raised that way and grew up that way. I was taught to do that. But I didn't lose my Chicanismo. But to put all that in Espanol, you understand? Soy Chicano del Barrio. And I didn't, I, that one didn't impinge on the other. I, I can go back and forth. And so I decided that I needed, as an English major, to, to become a writer, you know, that my, my English teacher actually encouraged me to do that. And then playwriting, because I was already hung up on, on theater. That's another story. But the fact is that uh, my trajectory has been one of looking for answers and trying to find some way to help my community, to help my relatives, to help my brothers and sisters, to try to better the world at the same process of trying to help myself. Uh, I knew that it was a prejudicial world. Uh, you know, I had an experience back in 1968. I was in Stockholm uh, for an anti-war movement. And uh, the, the Swedes were very liberal and very open-minded, very blonde, you know, very blue-eyed. <laughs> and, uh, and so they were very solicitous of the Chicanos and blacks I was with. We were a multiracial group, uh, anti-war movement. And, uh, and the Swedes said, no, you, said, you have a tremendous struggle in the United States, they said. Uh, well, we don't have racism here, he says. We, we don't have minorities here in Sweden. Uh, we don't have any problems, uh, except the Finns. <laughs> They're really lazy and they smell. <laughs> and he started with the whole royal, you know, and I said, wait a minute. <laughs> it's the same shit, you know what I mean? It's the same stuff. And okay, if the Swedes and the Finns have it out because they distinguish among them, it's all over the world, you know what I'm saying? So we need in America to get over this. This is our big challenge as a nation and as the American people because we come in all colors and we need to understand each other. And so my journey has been to try, not just to educate myself, but if I learn something, I pass it on. And I'm grateful that I have a family working with me. I met my compañera, a 54-year-old 50, uh, marriage here with my wife. We're celebrating 54 years. Uh, she's an educator as well. She started educating children. She became a designer and actor in the Teatro Campesino. She gave birth to three of our sons, one of whom is here, Laquín Valdez, who did the illustrations in the book, Laquín. Yeah. And his compañera, Maya Malan Gonzalez, also is here. Maya, uh, okay. So if, if you're going to meet me, you're going to meet my family. You know what I'm saying? It isn't just me. 
It's not about any one of us individually. We're a community, we're a family, we're a nation, we're a group. We need to learn to get to work together and not reserve sole credit or, or wealth with just a very select few. We can share it to everybody. We can make the world a better place if we're just with ourselves. And so that requires a movement, that requires political power, that requires strength and belief and faith in the human race. And I continue to do that through my work. The arts are a tremendous way to renew your faith in humans, in human beings and, and uh, to pass that on. And so uh, I'll come back to these subjects, but that's essentially my beginning here. Okay, so there you are. Thank you. All right. Well, Ginger and I have been married how many years, honey? <laughs> I rest my case. I lose. We got fifty-seven and a half. Fifty-seven, okay. <laughs> and we have two beautiful sons and two beautiful grandchildren. So there, family. That's good. <laughs> but teatro is all about family. I went to a, a conference the other day. The Lincoln Center Director's Lab on its West Coast branch had a, a workshop this last weekend and they asked me to speak about, guess what, uh, the, teatro the teatro. And uh, there's a new book out, Latinx Actor Training, which is an incredible anthology of articles uh, and, and discussions and you name it from people all over the country teaching acting from the Latinx perspective. Uh, a universal perspective using European models, et cetera, et cetera. But it's all about f every one of the contributors to that anthology, and there's like 30, talked about familia. Yeah, yeah. great. And that book is edited by Micah Espinosa and Cynthia Ducure, for those who want to One support. of whom was my student, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what was a crossroads moment for you as a college student? As a college student? Yeah. I loved theater. Um, when you read this, and I told you, you will. Luis talks about how he started doing theater, and it's a gorgeous story. And I wish you would share with them about the experience of the mask and all that. It's such a wonderful bit of, of history. I always wanted to do theater. I acted on television on television in the 1950s uh, in, at junior high and high school. I played a cute little Mexican. <laughs> I was a cute little Mexican. <laughs> And so I, but I always had to play a Mexican, Mexican. I never spoke English. My first lines were Pedro, Pedro, ven aquí. And I was talking to a German shepherd. Uh, <laughs> and so I learned at an early age. And you, know, you don't, I made a lot of money in three days, uh, but then I didn't work for another eight months, you know. So I realized I want to do theater, so I went to college. I had the most amazing professors at Cal State LA in the 60s. Uh, that was the beginning of the, the uh, higher education that Clark Kerr, who founded the University of California, the master plan for higher education with a junior college, state teachers college, and a university. And so the state teacher colleges were wonderful. They influenced, they, I mean, I wouldn't be here without all of those white men and maybe a couple of women professors in theater. And, and I think you would say this, how many Chicano professors did you have at that time? We were in high school like practically the same time. Again, I was only 12, but he was, uh, <laughs> we were in, in, in high school 58, uh, 58 on, and I was 1960 on. And so did you ever have an Anglo professor? I mean, a, a, a Chicana, Chicano, an African-American professor at San Jose State? At San Jose State, yeah, there was uh, a Dr. Guerra, you know, Mark Guerra, who, was uh, in the history department, uh, and I remember him vividly. Um, but that was it. That was it. And in high school, there weren't any, you know. Mm -hmm. And again, my uh, the teachers that I'm still in touch well, they're all practically all gone, you know. Mm -hmm. I think my English teacher from high school, the one who influenced me as a writer and uh, as a speech teacher also, uh, is still alive. He must be 95 now, living in Austin. Uh, a few years ago, we used to meet, he used to come to Asilomar in, in Monterey for conferences, and we spent time together, he and his wife, uh, visiting us, me and Lupe. And um, at last that time I saw him, he said something very touching to me, because, I mean, I've known him, I, I met him in 1956. Those are the dark ages, you know, in high school. Uh, but he, he, as a teacher, he found me, again, an interested student. And so he said, you always used to look at me, this is why I ended up teaching you, mm -hmm. you know, because when you're in school classroom, most students don't, don't want to be called, you know, so they're, 
they, they want to be not there. But those, I've learned early on that if I looked at my teachers, they begin to teach me, you know? So I made eye contact, and uh, Dr. Farrell, Ed Farrell, uh, recognized that in me. He said, I remember that from high school, he says. But the one thing that touched me, the last thing he said to me when I last saw him, it's been a few years now before the pandemic, he said, will you speak at my funeral? And I found that so touching, you know? Of course, I said, of course I'll. So I haven't heard yet that he's passed. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, there's time yet. But, but he was a wonderful teacher, uh, uh, Irish American. And, uh, and so, yeah, there, there were problems in school as you went along, right? And, and there was racism that was present. Uh, I was uh, instrumental in starting the La Raza Studies at, uh, at Fresno State. There weren't any Raza studies when I was in school, in college, okay? They just weren't. And uh, the closest that we came was a thing called El Circulo Castellano. We used to get together to speak Spanish, right? And they weren't all Latinos either. So that group was the most radical Hispanic kind of group on campus. San Jose State is where I was. But uh, later on, I mean, of course, things got, got radicalized. And um, I began to teach at, at Fresno State because the father of one of the teatro members, you may have seen him in the photographs, I think he's in the book, one of the photographs, uh, he's a tall Anglo, you know. It was what we used to call our APA, a all-purpose Anglo. <laughs> because he had to play friends and villains and that. You know, he was an oki and he was a, a grower. And, but he played the guitarron also, you know, which was great. But it so happens that his father was a professor, uh, Dr. Rippey, at Fresno State. And his family invited the teatro, the whole teatro. It was after we left Delano, we were in Del Rey and starving, eating papas and chile, you know, <laughs> basically. Uh, he invited us to dinner, so we couldn't refuse, man. It was a great dinner at, at their family home. And after dinner, Dr. Rippey approached me and says, uh, he says, I want to ask you a, a, a question. Would you be willing to teach? And I said, well, at Fresno State? And he, I said, yeah. He says, we have an experimental college, and we're starting a new class for 17 Mexican-American students that are coming in. This was the forerunner for the EOP program, the Educational Opportunity Program. And we need a special class for them about Chicano culture. So I said, OK, I'm willing to do it. You know, it, it wasn't pay, didn't pay that much, but it paid the rent for the teatro. So I said, I'll do it one day a week. And so uh, I began to teach. There were no there were no materials available. There were no books about Chicano history. There were literature, nothing. There was nothing. I had to find copies from magazines and Chicano newspapers, you know, and, and mimeograph my materials. And so we started La Raza. One of my first students was Lupe, my wife. <laughs> and, uh, and, but she was already political. She had been, we met on the March of Sacramento, actually, two years before that. And, and so uh, she came in and a breath of fresh air for me to see Chicanas. It was the Chicana movement in, in class. And uh, it was great. It was a tremendous opportunity for me to develop these materials. And so we developed the class and then the following spring, the fall of 68, the, the college then took my class and doubled it and tripled it, and it became La Raza Studies. And then I was asked, do you want to be the dean of, of this new college? And I said, no, I have the Teatro Campesino. I can't divorce myself from that. So they brought in another guy, Elias Jalisco, to become the co-chairs. And we developed the whole curriculum. We were like op turning over new ground. Nothing existed before. Our inspiration was the Mexican Revolution. You know, I, I, uh, I grew up in Delano, California, going to 16th of September celebrations. They bring out the stage on wheels and put it out in the middle of the street. And all these veterans from the Mexican Revolution, I'm talking the 1940s, all these veterans from the Mexican Revolution would be sitting up there. They looked like campesinos to me, but they had fought with Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata, and they gave stirring, you know, Mexican style oraciones. Man. It was tremendous. And, and so that planted a seed on me that was powerful because the first time that I heard Cesar Chavez speak was on that same street many years later when he was talking about the grape strike. But anyway, I decided that the Mexican Revolution and Jose Vasconcelos and La Raza Cosmica was a model. So when we organized the first class, it was based on Mexican materials, on the example of Mexican Revolution and, and the artists. And so we started La Raza Studies at Fresno. I think it was the first in the state, uh, probably the country. Uh, 
But then within a year and a half, a new president came to Fresno State and he fired all of us. He wiped out the whole program. He was Ron DeSantis' grandfather. Exactly. <laughs> now, this is, this is 1970, mind you. And exactly what Ron DeSantis is saying and what other critics have been saying now is what we experienced then. It's been, it's been you know, 50 years. And, uh, but it was a sense of ignorance. Uh, fortunately, <clears throat> Octavio Romano was head of the Chicano Studies Department at Berkeley, and he turned around and offered me a job, so I went to teach at UC Berkeley. <laughs> From Fresno State to UC Berkeley, it was a big step, you know? So, <laughs> so I, I didn't mind, but what's interesting is I took those materials that I had mimeographed, that collection, and began to add to it other things, and eventually I connected with a writer called Stan Steiner, and Harper and Rowe published it as the first Mexican-American anthology of Chicano literature. It was called Aslan. It's out of print now, but it served its purpose. It opened up the sluice gates, and other anthologies have since come. But you see what I'm saying? You start at the grassroots, and sometimes you just have to mimeograph. You have to make your own materials, but it becomes the seed of something more. And it's the same relationship that I had with Jorge when we met, and I knew he was a scholar. I said, it, it can't be all about action. It's got to be action plus reflection. You've got to be able to think about what you're doing and define your terms, you know? It's no coincidence that the Mayans had a written language, okay? And to be able to write in Mayan hieroglyphics was a high achievement. And only the princes were able to really do it. Well, now we have a lot of Mayan princes and princesses in the university campus. Mm -hmm. You're learning how to write your own history. Mm -hmm. And it all starts with this resurgence of La Raza studies. May it go on forever and become what it should be, which is American studies. Mm -hmm. All right. It's very difficult to imagine something that you don't see reflections of yourself in. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, the representation, you have to, to be it, you have to see it. And that's the power, I think, of the scholarship and the teatro. You, you put it out there for people to connect and connect through their heart. Uh, I would love for the two of you to share about the book and the importance of Mayan philosophy um, uh, to Latinx theater, but really empowering not only theater artists, but empowering us as creative leaders, especially this notion of the zero. And I'm, I'm struck when I've heard you talk about the, the concept of the zero, that it's having us recognize the holes in our hearts, the hungers that we have, and being in touch with our passion, what really we most love to do, the impact that we want to make on the world through doing it, and realizing that by putting that out there, it fills the hole in our heart, but it connects us to the broader universe, right? Through the reflection, but also the action. So uh, I, I'd, I'd love for the two of you to talk about the book and why you wanted to have this let me Theater see this the one. Is that there. Jorge's introduction? It's a brilliant introduction. Brilliant because he knows my work as an artist, and he's known my work uh, for quite some time now. It's fifty years, man. <laughs> and okay. and uh, it's a companion piece to what I wrote. You know, the vibrant being. This is the philosophical uh, method. You know, but in order to really understand it, you need to humanize. And this is where the theater comes in. And as a scholar and as a theater person himself, uh, uh, he took the works that we have created with the Teatro Campesino over the years and I've created as a playwright, and he put them into context. And so his uh, introduction to this book is uh, an essential part of the meaning of this book. It, it grounds it and it gives it uh, really a humanity that, that some people might not be able to grasp right away if they go to the abstract immediately. Uh, and so uh, the, that service that Jorge has done, he's been doing for years. He's been my explainer to a lot of people <laughs> for many, many years. And, and so I have the deepest appreciation and love for him because of that fact, that you find colleagues, you find people that are going to take your life's journey with you, like your partner in life. And this is my partner in life, too, as it turns out, you know, in terms of the work, because we're not just uh, we're, we're not just flesh and bone, you know. We are heart, and we are mind, 
and we are experienced. And all of that continually needs to put into, be put into perspective. That's why we have institutions of higher learning, so that, that that treasure house of human thoughts and feelings and experiences gets preserved and passed on to the next generation. So thank you, Jorge. You're okay. very welcome. Uh, but also, um, I have to say that we have an expression in Spanish, Nada cambia y todo cambia, or the other way around. Todo cambia, nada cambia. Everything changes and nothing changes, right? But this room and our presence here is, is magnified across the country, wherever Latinx students are of any Latino background and wherever there are people teaching these courses. Uh, as the first person to write a book about Chicano theater, I became the authority, like I knew it all, right? But in the old days, I, I was the only person teaching in a theater department in 1975 when we left Santa Barbara, Teatro de la Esperanza. And I found myself in a very, very strange new world in the theater department that had no concept of what Chicano theater was, much less what Cuban American or Colombiano or something. So then I had to begin reading the plays and writing about the plays and directing the plays. Uh, but it's all about passion all about passion. I had an Anglo student, a young lady came into my office as the undergraduate advisor at UC San Diego and she said, Professor Huerta, I want to, I'm a straight A student and I could get into any medical school, but you have to tell me why I should be a theater major. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you laughed because that's the silliest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> You mean I, I want you to starve? You mean I, I want you not to have a job? Are your parents willing to put you through theater training, really? Anyway, so I said, no, 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 it's up to you. You have to have a passion for theater. And I can't stop you from doing that. I've had, we've had so many students, you know, this is what I've got to do. Fine, do it, but do the research. Anybody can write about anybody's culture as long as they do the homework, you know? And so the whole idea of passion, I want to go back. I've got you, please tell them the story of, the paper mache. Yeah. yeah, okay, I'll tell it this way. Uh, I'm preparing my autobiography for publication, and the title of my autobiography is called The Monkey Mask, a memoir. And what it relates to is the experience that got me into the theater. It was 1946, and we were on the migrant path with my family. I was six years old, and we had been up to San Jose and picked apricots and prunes, and then we made our way back into the San Joaquin Valley to the cotton country where we picked cotton, you know, that fall of 1946. And it so happens it's after World War II and there were a lot of unemployed people. Japanese Americans were coming out of the concentration camps. They were in the fields as well. The Chinese were in the fields. African Americans from the South that had gotten away from the racist South were in the fields. Anglos, the Okies, you know, the John Steinbeck Okies were still in the fields. So I thought everybody was a prune picker, you know, everybody was a cotton picker. But there were so many people that the cotton season ended like that. I mean, first picking, second pick, boom. And people left then uh, after the first lush first picking to go pick grapes. And so, but we couldn't move out of the labor camp. It was a labor camp with 2,000 uh, 2, people at the, at the beginning, army surplus tents. And so... Um, we couldn't move because my dad's pickup had broken down. And so he had up in blocks, he was trying to fix it. And, uh, and so uh, we were living hand to mouth, basically. There was no reserve. So uh, we were fishing in the San Joaquin River and taking them home to my mom. We were eating fish tacos before they were trendy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but one morning, I, uh, about six o'clock, I almost drowned one morning. And um, my mother got very scared. She said, maybe you and your brother better go to school. So a big yellow bus used to pour come into the camp. And so we climbed on bus and went to the school. Now what, I knew I wasn't gonna be there for very long. Uh, I, could, I was bilingual, by the way. My parents spoke English and Spanish. They were born in Arizona. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, my mother, my mother used to entertain us before we went up to school because we were bored every night. And she taught us songs. She taught us, uh, she taught me three blind mice in Spanish. Tres ratas ciegas, tres ratas, you know? And she taught us to count in English and Spanish to a hundred. And she taught us our ABCs. This was the games that we played in this little shack, you know, that we ended up occupying. And so I took that knowledge into the first grade. It paid off later, but uh, in the school, the first school is a place called Stratford. Not Stratford on Avon, Stratford on the San Joaquin, okay? <laughs> And it's, it's really part of the Tulare Lake. The Tulare Lake has come back now, but it, it, it was part of the drainage. It was part of the sand, loam, sandy loam. Uh, and, and Stratford is in danger of being flooded now because of Tulare Lake. But anyway, Stratford, I went to school there. And um, 
when I had just take my bag and bring it back to my mom at the end of the day, she'd pack it the next day with tacos. And one morning, one afternoon is gone and I can't find my bag. I'd put it in the closet and I, the teacher saw me running around like crazy. She says, what did you looking for? I told her, she said, oh, a little brown paper bag. I took it. And I said, well, give it back. You know, she says, I can't. And she escorted me into a room in the back with my bag was all ripped up, floating in a basin of water. I thought she'd gone berserk. She said, well, you're local, la maestra. Look what she did to my bag. But then she says, no, no, look at this. She reached in, grabbed a piece, dipped it into some paste, put it on a mold. And it was a clay mold. It was an animal. It was a monkey. And OK, this was already November. So I knew it couldn't be for Halloween. What's this for, you know? And, and, and she said, you want to try it? And I said, I cried uh, another little piece. Another. At that moment, I discovered the secret of paper mache, that you could take paper, any paper, any bag, and turn it into this magical substance that took the form of whatever you put it on. And so I d discovered that the mask was for a Christmas play. She said, we're having a Christmas play. The whole school's involved, uh, the eighth graders, the school band, everybody's involved. It's called Christmas in the Jungle. And we need two first graders to play monkeys. So I forgave her about uh, <laughs> my bag, you know. Forget that, you know, when I audition, you know. So I auditioned the following Monday, and I got my first role in the theater. And I don't know how much competition I had, but I mean, I got in there. I, 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 was, I was for it, man. I was going to be a monkey, you know, and, and uh, I monkeyed around pretty good. And, and so then I, I saw this whole process. You know, they were building a set, fake trees, the jungle tree, and the old beat up school auditorium. And I got a costume that was better than my own clothes, you know, a little red vest, green, you know, red, uh, green shorts, little tail, you know, some shoes. It was fantastic. And then the taco bag mask, which she was beautiful. She painted it. So I was in heaven, man. This was going to be my debut before the world. And so the week of the show, which I came home on a Tuesday or something, and I told and my mom said, we're leaving tomorrow. And I said, but uh, mom, the play's on Friday. And she said, I know me who, but we've been evicted. And I cried and she cried with me. But it didn't make any difference. So at the next dawn, my dad got the truck started somehow. And we climbed into the truck and pulled out. And we passed through Stratford as it disappeared into the San Joaquin Valley fog. And I felt this hole opening up in my chest. I felt I could be destroyed. You know what I mean? It was a terrible disappointment for me. Uh, but I've always believed from that moment on that any negative can be turned into a positive. So uh, what happened is that that hole because I took with me the secret of paper mache, my unrequited love of the theater, and residual anger because we had been evicted, it became the hungry mouth of my creativity. I began to make masks. I began to make puppets out of paper mache. I began, my, my friends weren't very good at organizing, my cousins my, at improvising. So they said, we don't know what to say. Say this. <laughs> One line by line. Eventually, I was writing a whole page. I was seven years old and writing one page actos, and I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I was just giving them something. And so 20 years later, approximately, I went full circle and went back to Cesar Chavez and pitched him an idea of a theater of, by, and for farm workers. And that began the beginning of my career as an activist. But I was already had the germ from the time that I was six years old. And this is why my autobiography is entitled the monkey mask, okay? So there you are. I love that story. Uh, can you share too, what was Cesar's response when you pitched the idea of the teatro and, and how did it end up taking traction in the face of his response? I talked to Dolores Huerta first, which is interesting because <laughs> Dolores was, she's still receptive. She's 93 years old and going great guns, you know? And she said, oh, no, just, it's great. He says, uh, you should talk to Caesar about it. And I said, will you talk to him about it? <laughs> and so I, he went, she went back to Delano. This was in San Francisco. And uh, she, she set it up for me. So when I met Cesar, he says, oh, yes, Dolores told, talk, told me about you. What, what do you have in mind? And I said, a theater by four farm workers. We'll organize the campesinos. We'll put on short pieces and talk about the strike and sing songs and and he was very solemn, you know, he said, well, he says, okay, but I want to be honest with you. There's no money to do theater in Delano. There are no actors in Delano. Uh, there's no theater, there's no stage in Delano. As a matter of fact, there isn't even time to rehearse because we're on the picket line night and day, do you still want to do it? And my response was, absolutely, Cesar, what an opportunity. 
I was relating to the fact that this was the biggest farm labor strike in California history since the 1930s. And also it was happening in my hometown where I was born in a labor camp. So it was a big homecoming for me. I had thought at one point that Delano and Ernie Martin, that part of the San Joaquin Valley was the sump hole of the universe. I wanted to get as far away. I wanted to get to the moon. I wanted to get to Mars. I wanted to get the hell out of the San Joaquin Valley, you know. But somehow I ended up going back. My older brother said, you went back? You went back? And I said, yeah, I have a score to settle. And so uh, I, I went to Cesar with this idea because I'd already been influenced by Brecht in college. I learned about Bertolt Brecht. I learned about world theater. I worked by Comedia del Arte by working at the San Francisco Mind Troupe. And by that time, I had the elements that I could put together to create a farm workers theater. And so that's, that's how El Teatro Campesino was born. And true to Cesar's word, it was born on the picket line. It was born straight on the picket line on top of an old panel truck. We stood up and did two or three minute bits. This is the seed, that's all you need. And once we did that, we knew it's possible. And from there, we went to the strike meetings on, we on Fridays in a little room no bigger than this, quite frankly. We had 100 strikers. You can imagine 100 strikers gathering like almost like you, except they faced this way. And Cesar would be standing there we come in through the kitchen. We had a 10 foot by 10 foot area where we did the actos. The little kids would be sitting on the floor. Cesar would be sitting on the front row. <laughs> Actually, they always took the front row. And, 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 but the other campesinos are standing, they're looking in the windows, you know, they're going, you know. The fact is that it was like a little cauldron and the tighter it was, the more powerful the experience was. And again, it was like an explosion that the other campesino was born out of necessity. It was needed to keep the strikers' spirits up, to make them laugh at a situation that was dire. You know, it was terrible. We didn't have money. We didn't, we were cold. We were really running out of people, <laughs> essentially. But the teatro brought a spirit that always brought light and freshness to the room. I get that feedback from campesinos that are still around that saw that. And I knew that it wasn't me. It was the act of doing theater that did it. But it was coming from this momentum. And so uh, I'm grateful to Dolores and, and to Cesar for the opportunity to do that because I think it's in service of everybody. Okay. Because Illuminations is um, a chancellor's initiative that's really driven, and I wanna thank uh, Daphne Lee, Dr. Daphne Lee as director of Illuminations and really the partner in making these events happen. Uh, Illuminations is driven by the belief that every student having engagement with the arts makes them a stronger leader in their field, a stronger thinker. And uh, so I'm just really, I wanna highlight that. I'd love as the historian and scholar to hear your thoughts about why theater is more necessary now than ever before. And the resonance is thinking about the 60s and our moment and what for us at the university is really important for us to think about the, the urgent role of the arts in this particular moment. Do you have your sleeping bags with you? <laughs> <laughs> How can I? Uh, whoa, it's, it's such a difficult, you know, I, even though things change, they don't change. I mean, this room is proof that we have infiltrated. I, people had called it mainstreaming in, in an article that I wrote many years ago. I talked about infiltrating, we have a dean. We have chancellors, we have people in, field, in, in the theater alone. Not to mention, see, theater isn't just about learning how to act. It's learning how to think about necessary issues, how to act on those necessary issues. Luis wrote many, many years ago about the acto, which we used as Teatro de la Esperanza, a fledgling teatro. I knew nothing about actos, about what the farm workers were doing, but I knew what we were doing in the cities as an urban Chicano. And so the actos are still relevant today because they have a purpose. And one of the, re one of the five goals of the acto is to show or hint at a solution. You're going to satirize the opposition, you're going to make fun of the grower, you're going to make fun of the politician, whoever the enemy is. Actos can be used by either side. An acto uh, pro-choice uh, would be very well received at a Republican National Convention. An anti-choice acto would be the one to do at the Democratic, but they, they could work if they did what he says they should do, which is to show or hint at a solution, but also make fun. 
laughter. He, I, I've quoted him so many times early, early on in one of the first interviews, I think the first interview with Beth Bagby, 1967, or por allí, that we have to laugh in the face of the tragedy of what is going on to our people. And so I, I do believe that we need to really be able to laugh. We, laughter has been taken away from us with so much caca. For those of you who are not familiar with the Spanish language, <laughs> and you all apparently are, there's too much shit rolling on in our heads. And, and so we, I have to tell my students, focus, focus, don't be distracted. That's exactly how the enemy wins. He or she distracts you. Well, let's talk about this. No, but this is the issue. Oh, no, but what about this? You know, so in the educational field, we have made incredible impact. Are the books that he's written, the plays, that, the books, the articles, the shit that Jade has written, that, that Ricardo has written and published, that these are being taught in universities across the country, not just by Latinx scholars, but by people who are our allies and who understand that we have these issues and they want to know more about it. Uh, I, I, I could go on and on, Miha, you know that. <laughs> uh I'm uh, mindful have, have of a... the journey of our time, yeah. and I want to make sure we have time with the audience. I know that you probably have a burning question, which is, what's up with the soccer ball? And yes, I'd love for you to you, uh, use okay. it as the illustration to talk about. Um, yeah, we can go to the book. slides as well. Yes. Yeah, it's um, called Theater of the Sphere uh, for a very good reason. I mean, this is obviously a sphere. It's a soccer ball. <laughs> But uh, this is the key to your human nature. One of the things that we learn as we go into higher ed is that other cultures that have come along have done a great service to humanity as a whole. The Greeks taught us to respect the true form of the human body, you know, through the sculptures. And uh, other, the Chinese culture taught us, you know, Confucius is really about moral, moral concerns, you know, and there's a deep morality there that, that needs to be shared with the rest of the world. The mechanics that we get from Europe, the European culture, the aggression, all of that is very much a part of our human heritage. The Mayans gave us this. They gave us the ball. They were the first ones that uh, discovered rubber. They were the first ones to vulcanize rubber. It wasn't B.F. Goodrich, by the way, okay? <laughs> it was the Mayans. They had a plant and a root that they used to take raw rubber from a tree, latex, you know, and vulcanize it so that it became a ball. They were able to make rubber balls. And they, were, they had balls all over the world. They were made out of rubber, they were made out of wood, but very few could bounce. The rubber balls that the Mayans created had a tremendous resilience. And this influenced then their whole vision of the universe. They began to talk about the importance of vibration because they saw in rubber, you know, one of the essential qualities. So when I describe theater of the sphere, I'm not just describing the work of El Teatro Campesino. I'm talking about the way that the human body works. And I have some slides here that I'm going to breeze through very quickly because time is short. It, I need to do two weeks. Of some, I, last time when I was here, it was two weeks. <laughs> and, and I was just evolving the workshop. But this is a symbol from the book. What you see is the Huelga Eagle, the United Farm Workers Connected. It's a square inside a circle, uh, but it's a movement. The, the necks and the heads of the eagles begin to work on a, what they call four movement. Now we all lean. It's all symbolic, but you know, let's go on to the next slide, please. All right, so this is, now we Orlean, this is four movement. This is the, the Native American yin yang. This is movement. This is uh, the power of the four movement in the universe. And this is one of the symbols. Next slide, please, going on. And so they, in, in our ancestors, American ancestors incorporated this into the design of, this is the middle circle, into the design of their ceremonial centers. This is why theater is not just something that we have inherited from Europe. We've inherited from Europe gladly. Um, I love Comedia del Arte. I love the French uh, theater. I love the English theater. I love Shakespeare. But nothing uh, uh, really approximates what the Mayans were doing because they were theater. Their cities were ceremonial centers. Those pyramids were stages. And they could stage spectacles with 20,000 people at a pop. 
What you hear now, and this is the calumny, this is the scandal in our time. You hear a lot about human sacrifice, that those pyramids were really about human sacrifice. But you go to Chichen Itza, these pyramids all over the place, they weren't sacrificing people all over the place. They were working on the mathematical uh, implications of their buildings, you know. They were working because they knew math. Actually, there was an article published yesterday in the LA Times about the Mayan calendar that I was reading. And, and what they said is explain why the Mayans were cannibals. No. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. It, 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 it. it gets into the nitty gritty of the mathematics, but then it comes out that they're cannibals. And, and that calumny, that, that, that insult continues to resonate about people of color, but particularly Native Americans, that, that they just weren't decent enough. They were savages. And they pulled out hearts. Do you know how hard it is to pull out a heart? Ask any heart surgeon. <laughs> if you're going to open up the chest, how do you know where to cut? How do you know where to cut? And, get the, and anyway, it's a living thing, you know, that comes out. And, and they were fascinated with the human heart because this was a tremendous symbolic meaning to them. Because they understand the mechanics of the human body. But anyway, all this, their ceremonial centers were a square inside a circle. The square inside the circle is the name of Hunabku. El dador de la medida, el movimiento, the giver, the only giver of, of movement and uh, the measure. Okay, next, going, 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 going. And this is the ball game, the rubber ball game in, in 400 ball courts in, in 400 cities of stone. Moving on. This is the same symbol again. What's interesting is that this eventually is a symbol of two calendars. The round circle is a 360-day uh, solar calendar, and the square is the sacred calendar, 260 days. Those two calendars combine to encapsulate a concept of the supreme being, the creator. Moving on. And this is uh, where the two calendars intersect. Now this, I'm not going to go in this into detail, but you can see the smaller circle. Uh, one tiny circle there, the little one, is 13 days. 20 uh, they had 13, uh, 13 months of 20 days each, and that's the second circle. That's the Solkin, that is the sacred calendar. And then the, the edge over here is the solar calendar. And in order to establish a date, you had to have the date from the Solkin, the sacred calendar, and the solar calendar together. So they always named two dates, you know. So the 20 days is the Solkin, yes? Could I point out, this is only part of the larger Yes, you got to follow that the, circle. That's a huge all the way circle. Over and there. they are, um, como se llama, they're ratchets. They're ratcheted together. Yeah. They ratchet together and come back to the point of beginning every 52 years. Mm -hmm. This is why the Mayan calendar, again, the new fire ceremony was always relit every 52 years because it was renewal. And 52 becomes a very sacred word, you know. Okay, moving on. Uh, next one. Uh, Okay, this is, these are the symbols of the Mayan calendar. You can see the sacred calendar, the Tolkien, together with the Hab, which is a solar calendar. And what you see over here are 20 day names, 13 months of 20 days. And then you have the solar calendar. I decided to focus on the sacred calendar because 260 days approximates essentially the nine months that we all start our lives with in mother's wombs. And what it has to do is with human behavior. The solar calendar is about nature, about the moving of the planets and the sun. The sacred calendar is about human behavior and human responsibility and human evolution. Okay, moving on. Uh, and so these are the 20 days of the Tolkien, the Mayan sacred calendar, 13 months and 20 days each for a total of 260 days. And here are the five are the four columns. And then I have learned in working with this that it not only makes sense up and down, it also makes sense this way. Imish, Kimi, Chuen, and Kib belong together. Ik, Manik, Eb, Kaban. And I'll go over the next slide. And this is the way that it makes sense for us in the theater and at the Teatro Campesino, that the four columns represent the body, the heart, the mind, and the spirit. Now we're talking about how it was reduced down to the vibrant being workshop. The body, imish, is birth, a pregnant womb, it's called. Ik is breath, 
Akbal is flow like water. Khan is balance. Chikchan is gather all your life experience. Timi is death. Manik is rebirth. Lamat is passion. Muluk is compassion. Ok is love. The mind, Chuen, which means monkey, by the way, that's consciousness. Eb is paradox. Ben is language. Ish is the subconscious. Men is creativity. To believe is to create. To create is to believe. Mm -hmm. So, and then the spirit, or I didn't want to use the word soul because it gets confused, you know, with the whole Christian thing, but it's essentially the same concept. So I call it the spirit. Kib is your knowledge of something bigger than yourself, that you're aware that you, you something, this is what your immortality is. You're part of something much larger than yourself. A lot of people don't know that. Kaban is Mother Earth. Mother Earth who embraces us, who gives us life, and when we die, we go right back into her embrace, okay? So it's a scary thing, but it's life. It's Mother Earth. And then uh, it's Nab is the tongue, the flint knife tongue sticking out. And, and you learn then uh, to harm or to help. It's the, the tongue as a weapon. It's writing. And Kawak means turn yourself inside out. Turn yourself inside out. It means pregnancy. It means water, when a woman's water breaks, it means giving birth. And, and then a how is the solar power, it's the flower. It is the ability to be able to create. So what we have here is an evolution. And what happens then is that you can take any one of these and have it make sense horizontally as well as vertically. So what we've got at the bottom here is motion, and out of motion comes emotion, and out of emotion comes notion, and out of notion then comes vibration. And the thing is that you've got to move your body in order to really get your brain working. Okay, this should be part of our learning experience. Little kids can do that, right? And this is where the ball comes in and how we use it in the workshop. You learn to move because what the Mayan zero is, is really a spiral. This is why they use a conch shell as a symbol, but eventually it turns into a sphere. And so this is, we are made up of spheres. We are made up of spirals. Any of the dance movements, ballet, martial arts. And the one thing you know about the Mayan ball game, and I think there's this another slide, right? Go on to the next slide. The Mayan ball game, there it is, is that they used their hips. It was like basketball, but they couldn't use their hands. It was like soccer but they couldn't use their feet. It's a paradox. How could they play soccer without using their feet? How could they play basketball without using their hands? They use their hips. Now what happens when you do this and you propel the ball with your hips, to put it through a ring, by the way, is what you're doing is you're whipping the spine. And the moment that you whip the spine, you're generating energy all the way from your coccyx up to the base of your your brain down here, and you're activating yourself. This is why this movement is really, well, this is pretty universal, you know? <laughs> we wouldn't have, a, we call this the huracan, right? This is the huracan, but it begins here. And so you have to spiral. You have to learn how to spiral. And we teach this to kids, and we teach this to seniors. <laughs> I got this wire here. Oh, <laughs> that's all right. I'm 83 years old. You know, I can do this. So it, because this, it's, it's an exercise that fits directly with what the body wants to do. Instead of, you know, so I recommend getting yourself a ball, number five, soccer ball, and just trying it out, working with it, because this is the key that opens up your flow. This is the key that opens up your power. And you've got to be able to move physically before you can really move emotionally, before you can really move mentally, and before you can move morally. Aristotle, who defined, he de defined Greek drama, was talking about pathos, logos, and ethos. Now, it took Carl Jung to add the fourth column, which is eros, because the Greeks didn't deal with sexuality directly. Eros, pathos, logos, ethos is the same idea that is inherent in our four columns of mind, of body, heart, 
mind and spirit. Go on, please. Moving in. The next year, something we're almost done here. So any of the, this is the real ball. The third one there, or the second one from the right, is, is a real Mayan rubber ball. We use uh, number four, number five soccer balls to, to do the workshop. But you can do it without it. These are expensive. <laughs> and if you can just learn to do this, it's like Tai Chi, actually. But you, so this is what we do with our actors. We gotta get, you gotta move. You gotta move in order to get in there. Particularly if you're performing in a flatbed truck. <laughs> you gotta move. Next, please, I think we're almost done. This is what happens. This is called getting on the ball. Mm -hmm. So part of the exercise is to be able to balance and then to squat and then to stand up. I don't recommend trying this on your own. You need a spotter, you know, and, and you need people to help you. But this is the object. After about two, two weeks, people can do this, mm -hmm. and you incorporate that into your body. Moving on, please, last one, I think. This is my maestro. This is Domingo Martinez Paredes, who wrote several books on Mayan culture that I have incorporated into my work, and I'm giving him credit because he was my maestro. I met him in Mexico City in 1972. He died in, 19, uh, in the middle of 1980, 94. Uh, he, uh, he had been a professor of Mayan studies, a Yucatan, from Yucatan uh, at the UNAM, the University of Mexico. But uh, a lot of American and British scholars were coming and putting him down because he was criticizing the fact that they couldn't speak Yucat Mayan Yucateco or, or Quiche Maya. So they drummed him out of the university. But when I met him, he was earning his living by being an escribano, writing letters for the unlettered, you know, for the illiterates in Mexico City. But his whole house was a his living room was his office. His books kicked back to the ceiling because he published paperback copies. Un continente y una cultura, el, maya, el idioma maya hablado y escrito, on and on and on. <laughs> I've incorporated those into my work, and so I acknowledge him. I, Maestro Andres Segura, Capitán de Danza, introduced me to Martínez Paredes, and Domingo, uh, well, Domingo Martínez Paredes is the maestro. These artwork would not have been possible without having the images written by somebody. And my son, Alakin, wrote, uh, the, wrote literally the glyphs that I use in the book. Stand up and take a bow. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm proud of the fact that the oldest extant play in the Americas, the oldest recorded play, is a play called El Rabinada Chi yes. that was done by the Quichemaya in what is now Guatemala 2,000 years ago. Okay, Laquin and a compañero went to the Guatemalan highlands and witnessed the Rabinada Chi still being performed by Indios Guatemaltecos, Mayan Indians in the highlands of Guatemala. And they went again and shared the Vibrant Being workshop <laughs> with these Mayan campesinos in the Guatemalan highlands. What goes around comes around. We are linked to America's destiny. It is something that we need to share with the world. But before we can even begin to do that, we have to share it with ourselves. Okay? This has nothing to do with cannibalism. It has nothing to do with cutting hearts out. It is about enhancing the moral fiber of every human being. So America, find your heart and be reborn. Mm -hmm. That's it. I don't balance on balls. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> we literally have two minutes no. uh, left, no. and I would like to invite you uh, because it would be it just uh, it, it wouldn't be optimal, right, to ask a question and only have sixty seconds. Um, I'd like to invite us in showing our gratitude. You know, thinking about their legacy to invite people to share a few words about how this presentation today has impacted you and what you're leaving the presentation with uh, as, as a way of sharing with both of our maestros uh, how their work has touched you today. So who? Thank you. Hi, my name is Misael and uh, for uh, Luis, uh, I've, I'm a kid from Los Angeles and uh, growing up, I've watched uh, across several different, like, elementary school, middle school to high school, 
the Zoot Suit uh, play has always been my personal favorite, being a kid from Los Angeles, uh, having people in that culture. So that's something that I just wanted to share with you. Thank you for that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of came full circle at every grade level. So thank you for that. And um, one thing that I kind of took away from this is that, you know, finding your identity as a Chicano, as a Mexican-American, uh, it's like super important and it's it's something that isn't valued as much uh, maybe nowadays and especially as you go on in education uh, sometimes you're kind of taught to shy away from that side of yourself but it's very refreshing to hear from you guys uh, having been in the educational field for so long so thank you for that mm -hmm. thank you and I want to I want to give a plug uh, on the heels of what you said. Mojada opens uh, tomorrow, and there's flyers there in the back of the room. Please take one and really spread the word, um, so that it's a wonderful uh, play. Yeah, you know. it's an amazing play. Luis Alfaro's mm -hmm. work. Um, so please. Lakin was in. Which one? Lakin. And Lakin yeah. was in the Oregon yeah. Shakespeare Festival West Coast debut of the play. And we will be sending out a survey. So when you receive that survey, please fill it out because we would love to hear from you. Thank you. Take one more. I also actually need to inform you that Lakin, uh, my son, uh, is teaching the Vibrant Being Workshop out of Studio Luna in East LA. Yes. And uh, they're having several sessions, but if people register, they can open up other sessions. It really needs the work out, you know? You can't just talk about it. This is just a teaser. Mm -hmm. But uh, Lakin Valdez, you know, his wife, Maya Malan Gonzalez, have Studio Luna on, uh, what street is it on? It's on First, First Street. On First Street in East LA. And you can find, how can they find the info? Um, they can come chat to me and I'll give them the link. This is Maya, stand up so we can see you. Talk to Maya, who will tell you about how to make contact with the Maya. All right. <laughs> Um, well, my call, I'm loud, so I don't know. No, no, they're, they're recording. Oh, okay, gross. All right. <laughs> well, I'm Angela. I'm one of the MFA directors here. Mm. Um, and I, my comments more towards you, Dr. Huerta, because you and I had a conversation like, oh my God, back in like 2010, something like that, because Josefina Lopez introduced us. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you remember, I and you don't have to, and it's okay. But um, <laughs> but you took me out to lunch, and you encouraged me to like do further education and to like go to grad school. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do that because that's already like a lot of school. I already got my BA, right? And then you said to me, "There's very few of you who want to do directing, so you should do it." And so, like, well, it took forever, but now I'm here, and so I, this is like I'm finishing my second year. So it's yeah, so I want to thank you. I could die tomorrow and be happy, okay? <laughs> we have time for one more, one or two more. Well, it's a pleasure having you guys here. Um, Luis, I don't know if you remember, you came to East here, Brian, or I think 69, 70, 71, the other compass, you know, do you recall coming here? It could be. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, what happened? I, I, yeah, Teatro came over here, and I was uh, I was here at UC Irvine, and one of the first uh, thirteen EOP students that arrived at UC Irvine. So EOP was a special, very special to me. But I ended up going with Teatro to to Modesto and Fresno and uh, the the Leno. That's right. Yeah, I was there cruising around with you guys for a while, and what you did, what you allowed me to do, is to leave my pachoquismo and my choloismo back in East LA and learn to become the kind of person I've become over the years. So I just wanna thank you from way back that uh, you're where, you've been an influence in my life ever since <laughs> I first met you in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. So thank you very much. Thank you, Excellent. thank you so much. <laughs> the pachuco, the colors are red and black, you know, were a reference to the indigenous culture. And uh, I wanted to defang, you know, the idea of juvenile delinquency, you know, is somehow something inhuman. But as a matter of fact, it has very deep roots. And the, one of the signs is called Ish. Uh, it's in the third column, you know, with the mind. It's the subconscious. And it's called the Jaguar sun. Because the day sun is the eagle sun during the day. This is the Mayan thought. And at night, it becomes the Jaguar sun that goes into the darkness. El Pachuco is the Jaguar night. El Pachuco is the transcendent figure, you know, is on the streets. 
He's the dean of the school of hard knocks, you know? He has street knowledge, he has experience. It's the law of the jungle that he knows very well. And so I wanted to dramatize that through El Pachuco that Edward James almost embodied brilliantly in, in the play and in the movie mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, our, uh, our journey is coming to close. I want to thank Daphne Lee, Illuminations, the Office of the Provost, the Office of the Chancellor, for, uh, and the Claire Trevor School of the Arts uh, for uh, collaborating together to have this make this event possible. Uh, I want to thank both of our maestros for the incredible work that you've done and everyone in this room being part of this living sculpture that will continue to resonate because of our coming together. We invite you to connect with them uh, at the reception, which is just down the hall. And, and so, um, Am I forgetting? And I want to thank uh, all of our staff from the Claire Trevor School of the Arts for our media team um, uh, and IT for making sure that we had wonderful tech, but also a beautiful reception to transition to. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you, Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you.